Yeah, hi, my name is Stefan, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here at the uh, Node Institute for the 14th Touch Designer Roundtable Berlin. Um, it's always a pleasure to see uh, old and new people. Um, and today we're going to have, uh, like always, three presentations. The first comes from Acrylicode, um, which is uh, Philippe and um, yeah. Ma Maria Girl, <laughs> is, uh, yeah. um, and uh, they're doing generative art, and um, you might know them from their YouTube and Patreon tutorials. And um, Philippe is going to uh, talk about job executes today and uh, what they can do and how he's using them. And then we're going to hear from Alpha Moonbase, which is now hiding behind the tech. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, callbacks and event in system architecture. So you see today is less about projects, but more about technical details. So uh, that's that. And then we're going to um, switch to Markus Heckmann, coming in from Toronto with news from Touch Designer. And there's like a new um, audio thing for binaural audio, which makes a lot of sense with the VR workflow. So he's going to talk a bit about the VR workflow in Touch Designer. But uh, without further ado, um, let me introduce Philippe. He's going to uh, enlighten us a bit about job executes. Thank you for that, Philippe. Okay. And also, there are still a lot of free places here in the front. So don't be shy and just grab them while I'm going to disappear here. <laughs> Hi, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of uh, marketing. So here is my Instagram if you want to follow my Polish animations. Um, here is also my YouTube channel. I have mostly uh, Touch Designer uh, tutorials. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, I also have a Patreon where I also reduce uh, custom uh, components or um, yes custom stuff, you can also check it out. And on August, I'm gonna be making part uh, with this uh, college collective in uh, Prenzlauer Berg, a uh, container space. We're gonna do some audiovisuals, performances, and if you want to just join or just do something with us, uh, just write here to college collective, and yes, we'll be happy to meet with you and do stuff. <laughs> so uh, let's start. So, um, First, I'm going to start talking about uh, basic, uh, basic like uh, Python uh, expressions. So let's say if I create here a constant chop and I create here a noise chop, uh, let's say if I put this constant to the period, whatever. So here we can see that what happened here, it automatically created a reference, meaning op constant one. And with these square brackets, he make the reference of chan one, which is this guy. So this is like the uh, basic thing in Touch Designer that with op and then with this string and the name of the operator, you can access the operator and you can access to its properties. It could be parameters, it could be uh, value of some channel, um, it could be whatever. So um, more than that, uh, we can also type here uh, other Python expressions. I know the most famous one, abs time dot seconds. I'm not going to write it because this is like in every tutorial. But uh, things like um, that are nice, for example, that I use often is uh, me dot time dot uh, frame divided by me dot time dot end. And this will give us a fraction of the timeline. So Actually, it will become the, this is going to be the zero and this is going to be the one, and everything is going to be interpolated. And this could be nice for some projects, <laughs> whatever. Uh, we can also create also more complex expressions here. We're not limited only to have uh, like a really only a one, one value. We can also have expressions like, uh, for example, uh, one if uh, me dot uh, time dot frame is. Uh, bigger than, uh, smaller than 10, else is zero. So this guy is gonna be zero, and at the beginning of the, the I mean, when the timeline goes until the end, you're gonna see it soon, it's gonna boop, go from zero to one. And yes, and as you see, uh, we can put more, more complex uh, expressions to this. 
Okay, uh, now um, I'm going to also talk real quick before I, I start to the, with the chop execute that we have also a text that where we can write Python code and we can type here. Um, I'm going to. So if you didn't know that, here's two boxes. So here's the value and here's the expression. So sometimes if you want to turn off the expression and get the value without losing the expression, this is the way to go. Um, so here I can. Um, Always, if I come here, uh, if I expand it, I see the Python name of the parameter. So for example, in the text, I can say op um, noise one, which is the name of the operator. And then I can say dot par, because I'm accessing the parameters. Then I'm going to say the name of the parameter, which is period. And then I'm going to say dot val, and it's going to be, I don't know, 0 0.5. And this guy, I need to right click and um, run script or command error. So if I run the script, it changes the value to 0 0.5. OK, so uh, that's great. But we want to be able to uh, execute this code or any code uh, by a chop. So this is the main uh, thing of today. So um, if we attach here, um, let's say after um, this guy, we can attach here a chop execute. And here I'm going to open my code editor uh, because uh, I like it more. <laughs> uh, so here, the first thing about the chop execute is um, these on off switches. So this is, uh, you're going to tell Toji Sanger where do you, when do you want to catch the event? So right now, this guy is going from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. But I only want when it goes from 0 to 1. So I only want to execute some code in that case. So I'm going to turn off this uh, value, and I'm going to say off to on. So when this goes on to off. And let's say when I want to go off to on, I want to change my seat randomly. OK, this is a very, uh, very practical uh, use case. I think I use it a lot. Some, sometimes you just want to randomize the noise at some point. So uh, in order to do this, we, of course, we open this, and we see it's called seed this parameter. Okay? So we go back here. We already turned the on to off on. So actually, we can just get rid of this stuff, and we can get rid of this stuff. So this is the only function that is going to be triggered. And if we want some kind of random values, we need to la import random, which is a library in Python that lets you create random numbers. So uh, when this guy. So the code that I'm going to put here is going to be executed when the chop, with this chop, goes from 0 to 1. So I'm going to type here op noise 1, which is the operator that I want to change. And then I'm going to say dot par dot seat dot val is equal to random dot uh, random. Uh, this is going to give me a, a, a random has a, a few methods. So random dot random is going to give me a value between 0 and 1. But I can also get a uniform that is going to give me a value between uh, 0 and 5, or whatever values I put here. But it's going to give me a float. That means like something like 3.2 or uh, 4 point whatever. And if I want an integer, I can go and say rand int. So these are the three functions that I use the most. Random, 0 and 1, floating point, uniform. You put the two values, and it gets you between this range a floating point, and random gets an integer. So I went from 0 to 10,000, because the seed can be uh, go. So now every time that this guy is changing, we can see that now the seed is uh, changing. So um, this, is, uh, this can be very, very useful, because you can have um, a central part where you're going to make one or even more changes to your network. And yes, this is um, very, very useful. In the chop execute, we, we, we're here writing value, but we can also read values from any operator, from any parameter. We just need to say op, the name of the parameter, dot par, and then the name of the uh, op, the name of the operator, dot par, the name of the parameter. OK, so uh, let's say if we want to, for some reason, change the expression of this period, we could also go here and uh, let's, duplicate, uh, let's duplicate this line. And then instead of uh, seat, we're going to go with uh, period. And instead of uh, val, we can also change the expression with xpr. 
And then here we can pass a string, which is gonna be the expression. So let's see, op uh, constant one, and this is gonna be uh, chan one, which is gonna be the um, chan one, which is gonna be uh, this guy. So when this goes uh, back until the end, um, then this period is gonna have the reference to this. And I will see. So this is just to show you what uh, you can do, how you can control really any parameter and read through any parameter. And we can also have, um, um, yes, like uh, we can, in, in this on to off, we can put more expressions. So I'm gonna just show you what else you can do. For example, in some cases, you have some operator, let's say this noise, and I want to just uh, bypass this. But I just want to bypass this in certain part of the uh, visuals, so I want to bypass it with this job uh, chop execute. So here I can say uh, op, and this guy is called noise two, and then I can say bypass and then equal to false. So when these guys go until the end, uh, this is gonna yes. Ah, it didn't work. Oh, I'm sorry. This maybe with big p. Ah, maybe, maybe. Okay, we, another thing we can do is, so we can go here and here also it has this uh, Python documentation that it will open and we can see that uh, these are the members of, the, of this specific operator. These are the members of the chop. Um, so every chop has these operators and uh, uh, these, these uh, members and then the methods are here and here it should have in the operators something uh, bypass? Bypass. Okay, so get our set bypass. So somehow uh, I'm using the new general <laughs> release. I don't know uh, if this is, is the. <laughs> you have to set bypass to true. Ah, to true, of course. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Great. Now, makes sense. <laughs> so, um, and yes. And if uh, at some point, uh, let's say you have uh, multiple visuals uh, in base or containers or whatever, here you can have your uh, really complex network with just a bunch of noise and stuff like that. Uh, we can also get uh, this parameter, uh, this uh, allow cooking, which should be somewhere uh, here. Uh, allow cooking, great. And we can also set uh, this. So for example, if you have like uh, different uh, visuals in this container and you want to, with some MIDI node, you want to just stop cooking it because you just crossed it with another uh, comp, uh, you can also do it uh, here with the expression, um, here base one. So we go here base one and then we say uh, low cooking and this time is false. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then if we go, Yes, so now you, I hope you, you start to seeing what you can do, how you can manipulate um, the, the operators in Designer. I think power, uh, Python is very, very powerful just uh, for controlling stuff. Uh, let us get your uh, other examples so you can just uh, wrap your mind and your head around what you can do. Uh, let's get a movie file in and let's get a folder that and this folder that I'm just gonna go to some pictures that I have here somewhere media, I think this. Okay, great. So now we can see that we have some data here in this table, um, I mean the, in, in this dot. And with Python, we can of course access uh, to any row and any column. We can read that and we can write to it. Uh, so. This, uh, this example can also apply if at some point you have, I don't know, some data that you measure it uh, from the air quality or from humidity or whatever, and you just import this data into Touch Designer, you can actually read this data and make this data, um, uh, use this data to drive parameters. So it's data driven approach. So um, here, what I want to do is um, to, I want to pick randomly an image from this and I want to set this parameter, which is the file parameter, with the path 
of the image that is here. So uh, in order to do this, uh, we just go here. And um, the first thing we need to do is we need to check, OK, how long is actually this guy? So in order to do this, I'm going to say uh, max index, which is the max possible index that I'm going to get. And I'm going to say op folder 1, which is the dot that I want to get. And then this guy has some function that is called rows that gives me an array with all the rows that it has. But I just want to have the, len the length, so I can do len. And I can say minus 1, because I, the len gives me uh, just the amount of rows, and I want just an index. And in, it's zero base, so uh, we need a minus 1. Great. So now we have uh, the max index. Now uh, we want to have a random row, and we want to get the path of a random row. So in order to do it, uh, I'm going to say random row. So it's going to be op, then folder 1, which because is the, uh, that that I'm targeting. And now with the square brackets, we can, have, uh, we can pass two integers. So 0, 0 would mean I want the first row and the first column. The first parameter is the row, and the second parameter is the column. So that would give me right now name. Okay, But I want actually just one row from the 1 to 9, and I want the column 1. OK, so the column, I, I know that is actually the 1, because I want the path. And the row, I want some random number. So in, in, I'm going to get first the index, so it's a little clean. Random row index. So this is equal to random.randint. And then it's going to start at 1, and it's going to go until the max index which is this guy that we already computed. So why one is because we don't want the name. I mean, this row, we don't want to use it. We want to go from here to there. And now we can use this random index to get it uh, here. So this actually random row, I'm going to run random row path. So this guy is going to have the one of, run of one of those. And now I'm actually done. So actually, just need to go to this guy, movie file in. I'm just going to copy paste it because I'm lazy. op movie file in dot par dot file dot val is going to be random path. OK? So uh, if we save this, and hopefully I don't make any error, <laughs> then we will get a random image. OK, great. So it works. So and we are not limited to only one. We can actually just have uh, two of them and just get uh, another uh, random index. So I'm just going to actually copy paste uh, everything by, by the max index because this is the same for both. And I can, uh, yes, I don't need to change the names of the variables. I can just say movie file um, two. And now I have. Uh, Two images changing randomly, and yes, and I can you know cross them, and I can also um, yes, I'm just gonna put the cross. So and let's say right now um, I have uh, the cross. I can also read this this cross value, and I can also randomize the one that is not selected. So that means that for example, I'm displaying this one. I want to go to one and to randomize this one. So in this case. I can actually just uh, decide what I'm going to randomize based on some condition. And right now, the condition is the value of the cross. So um, what I can do is uh, I'm going to first comment this thing um, out, or maybe I'm going to copy that later. So I need to know the cross, val, the cross value. And this is going to be op dot, uh, cross one dot par dot cross dot val. So it's because this guy is called cross. So I'm saying op cross one dot par because I'm going to get the parameter dot cross and dot, dot, dot val. And then I can check if this guy is, let's say, if this guy is 0, I want this guy to go to 1, and I want to randomize this guy. OK? So uh, if I'm going to cast it to, to an int because uh, I think it might give me uh, a float. So if the value is equal to 0, so what do I want to do? Um, I want to um, change 
this cross to one. So I can say op cross one dot par dot cross dot val equal to one. And in the other case, I wanted to set it to zero because I know that the other possible value is one. So here it's gonna go to zero. But not only I want to set it to one, I want to randomize the movie file in one. So when this guy does zero, I wanted to go here and I wanted to randomize this guy. So I already have the code, the max index, I can leave it here. I can get the random index from here. So I cross it, I get a random index, and then I, I get this guy here and I can even reuse the random index to put it here. And now I can just do the same, but for the other one, for movie file two, and hope if that works. So right now it's zero, so it goes to one, but it didn't randomize it. It didn't randomize it, or maybe it was just, so it's crossing, but it is not randomizing. Wait a moment, random it didn't. Hey. Okay, ah, wait, we have an error. It's good to look at an error. <laughs> so uh, random path is not defined. Random path, ah, of course, I also need to, to get this guy, yes. I'm sorry, now. <coughs> so uh, now, great, so now it's working. So now this guy is only is switching and randomizing the one that is not visible. So right now he's gonna switch to the, this one and randomize this one. And this is basically a VJ set. You can just put animations to this and you just put a lot of uh, folders to this. Right now the cross is uh, very hard. If you want to have some animations, there is a great component called Twinner. I also have a tutorial on that, just check it out. <laughs> and you can just uh, combine this technique with the Twinner. So uh, another thing that I wanted to, to, to show you is uh, something that um, it's, uh, uh, I, I want to ramp, great. And let's say when I have this color, I have, I don't know, some other random color, and I want some color in the middle. Okay, great, this blue. So something I would like to do is uh, this guy to animate this movement, okay? But this is not possible with the, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think that this is not possible with Touch Designer without Python, because this guy is actually here in, encoded in this part, in this pos. So actually we need to write something that changed this parameter. And lucky for us, we have the chop execute. So what we can do is we can get an LFO we can get uh, the frequency to something to 0 0.1, we can get the amplitude to <laughs> 0 0.25 and the offset to 0 0.25, great. And now we have this thing going, uh, maybe the offset a little more, maybe 0 0.5, so it's just oscillating around the middle. Okay, it goes from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5, great, that's good for us. So now um, I want this guy to actually drive this parameter, okay? So what we can do is we can use an chop execute. But this time, we're not using the on to off that we use here. So the on to off is only for zero one values, for something like clack, clack, clack. But now here we can use the value change. So here I'm gonna open again my code editor. I'm gonna delete everything but this. And on the value change, I know that the value that I want to get is, uh, I actually, is passed here to the function, it's called val. So actually I can just say op, let me get the name, ramp keys. And I want the row to column zero, okay? So I can just put here row two column zero. And I don't know if I think, I think I have to do the val, but I'm not sure, maybe like this. And that's, that's it, that's it. So in just one line of code, we could get the the LFO to actually drive the thing. And 
like I said, you can go crazy with this. You can uh, animate different points of the ramp. You can also choose a random color and calculate the opposite color or three complementary colors and just create some generative color palettes. Or uh, yes, uh, you can just uh, go crazy with it. Uh, OK, so I will recap with OP. And then the name of the operator, we can get the operator. We can also go to this uh, question help to know what we can access from this operator. And for all operators, we can go to the parameter page and we can only place, if you click here on, the, on this plus, it's going to open everything and you can see all the Python names. And this is uh, very useful. And sometimes, let's say you want to create like a custom comp and there is some uh, causing of the chop execute that is called param exec, which is very uh, similar. So let's say I'm going to create a, a base. And this guy, I'm just going to go and customize the component. I'm going to create here some kind of uh, uh, do it. <laughs> and there is going to be a, a, a pulse. And I'm going to go to the other part. Great. So we have this parameter do it. So now when we go here uh, into this, in the custom page, we have this kind of pulse. And let's say if we want to do something based on this, we can uh, go here and then here go to the param execute. And this param execute is similar to the chop execute. You can also get this kind of stuff. So I just want to do the, the um, uh, on pulse. And right now in the LPs, I want to do parent actually just parent <laughs> and the parameters I'm going to just put an asterisk but if I want to do it only for the do it I can just type here do it and right now uh, I can ah, whatever I'm just going to create another noise <laughs> or uh, let's say a circle <laughs> whatever so every time that I click on this pulse let's say I'm going to here open my parameters here let's say that every time that I want I do this, I want to change the radius uh, from uh, 0 to 0 0.5. So what I can do is I already have this thing. I already have the on pulse. The OP is this guy, and the parameters are this guy. So I can go here, and I actually can delete everything but the on pulse. So it's clear what's happening. And here I can say OP circle 1 dot par dot ah so this guy has some kind of uh, radius x radius y so uh, first I'm gonna uh, generate a random number between 0 and 0 0.5 import random so here I'm gonna say uh, my num whatever it's gonna be equal to random dot ra ah, so uniform it's gonna be handy for this uni uniform and 0 and 0 0.5 Great. So now I can say radius x dot val equal to my num. And I can just uh, wait. Now, duplicate this line, circle, and say x, I say y. Great. And now every time I pulse it, I get a uh, random, this guy. Not only I can modify parameters, but I can also create operators connect operators, do some crazy shit. So, um, <laughs> so yes, uh, for example, I wanted to also to show you um, some, uh, uh, I think it's this guy, yes. So something that you can do uh, with uh, something, some projects that I've, um, that I, this is just a work in progress, but, um, so what I wanted to do is like I have a projection mapping setup and I have uh, each face on the Canton mapper already mapped. Okay, so let me just show here the Canton window. So I have uh, these faces already mapped and let's say I want to group them uh, in a generative way. So I want to be able to be flexible enough to randomize the groups or to uh, group this by name, uh, by number. Okay, so the way I thought about this is I numerate the faces clockwise 
from left to right, from uh, left to right, uh, up to bottom. So this is one, two, three, then here four, five, six, then yeah, whatever you got it. So uh, I numbered the faces, and now I want to I wanted to have a way in order to um, to to put the um, the to group them. Okay, <laughs> so here. What I did, um, let me de destroy it. So first, I, I wanted to know, okay, how many inputs do I want to map in the projection? So let's say uh, three, and then I can say here create, and it create me uh, the, the groups, and then I can say uh, randomize because I'm too lazy, but I could actually just name each face for each group, and then I can say join group, and then if I put uh, different inputs, uh, I can get uh, a projection mapping with some, I mean, right now I'm just putting some constant, and I can just actually randomize them and join again, and randomize them and join them again, so I can have some kind of uh, setup, and the main part of this is just uh, creating a bunch of operators and connecting them, and with a couple of parameters queued. Okay, uh, I think that was it. I hope I give you some knowledge. <laughs> And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Any ah, questions. <laughs> questions. I have a comment. Um, just that there's a very useful um, GitHub uh, stuff that it's called TD Completes Me. And you add this to the project, uh, to the root of your project, and it's going to give you a completion in uh, Visual Studio Code. Oh, nice. Uh, of like common like parameter names and, and stuff like that. Good to know, good to know. <laughs> Yes, I mean, of course, uh, Python is a huge topic, but I, I really think that the traditional documentation it's uh, very good. So um, here, you're always gonna find everything you can do. You know, I mean, I cannot imagine things beside this because this is like what traditional give me to control. So every time, you need to know that with OP you get some operator, and this operator has some properties. And here is a list of all methods and properties that you can access and modify. Uh, I mean, if you want to learn more coding as coding, I think uh, I learned with uh, this coding, but Python. Um, but this is more like, uh, yes, I mean, you have small problems that you need to solve, and then you can just program it and uh, learn from it. But uh, I don't know, I don't know how, I mean, for me it was very useful, but I'm also a software developer, so I'm very into code. Uh, but the most important thing for you to get in Torch Designer is how to get components, how to move around the parameters of the components. You know, like when you have some idea and say like, ah, I want this point to this component to behave this way, and I cannot find some kind of operator combination, that you just put a, a chop execute and say, okay, OP, this guy, what do I want to do? I want to share a parameter, so dot par. Which parameter do I want to sh show? And then you go here on the list of the pars. It's like, ah, okay. Or on the P here. Which parameter do I want to change? Ah, I want to change the rotate. Then you change the rotate. Or I want to uh, enable, disenable, or whatever. You can also get in inspiration from, <laughs> from what you can do from, the, from this here. Of course, there are things that are um, more complex or more deep into programming, um, but it's also like a journey. You don't expect to learn this from one day I think just having a couple of expressions that spice your workflow uh, could be nice. There's also a way to print like all the functions that are like existing within objects instead of the, um, the monitor, for example. So you could, um, if you have an object and you don't quite know what functions you can apply to it, you just use the function dear and then open it and then put it in your object and then it will tell you which functions are associated with that. Uh, yes, that's a good point. I actually used to do that, but I 
kind of feel that uh, I mean because the I mean what you mean is uh, open the, this text port and getting, but uh, I think it's a little messy to read from there, and I'm also kind of used to to read documentations. So, but it's a personal uh, taste. So if, if you want to do the the fast thing, uh, go here uh, the dir and then the the operation, uh, and yes, something I forgot to say. Something I forgot to say. Um, if you're creating some uh, a chop executes or text or whatever, here, for example, in my chop execute, I said, uh, let's say, op ram, ram keys. If I try to do it from here, if I try to do this, op ram, uh, ramp one uh, keys, this is, gonna, this is not gonna find it. I mean, this is gonna uh, equal to, uh, to this guy. This is not gonna find it because the, the, so A is none, it's not existent. And the reason is because this text port is in a global context of touch designer. So in order to get the RAM key, you need to type slash project one, because this is in project one. So here you need to say project one, okay? So, and now you say A, now you get the date, the dot. So this guy is in a global context, you need to put the absolute path to the operators, and if you're doing inside a network, you can just put the name and that will do it. But and thank you for drag and drop the operator to give you the full path. Yes, exactly. Yeah. As I think here, paste text? Yes. If you just drag and drop and paste text, you can also get the, the full um, operator. Yeah, also, there's like in the help, there's a section called tries and tips and tricks, I think. That was something I was referring to a lot when I was like starting out and had no idea what to write here. And the other thing is whenever you make like an expression link, like also by dragging and dropping things, then you also see the script being generated. And like looking at that and thinking about what it means is also a very easy way to get into it, I find. Like before even starting to write several lines or something, it was already extremely useful. Yes, you can also write yeah. here code here, or you can even drag and drop this guy and say open that, and you can have it here. No, I mean like the live interpreter, just like the window you just had. Oh, textbook. Yeah. Ah, yes, you can also so write. You can already write Python. And yes. Direct feedback and everything, so it's quite helpful if you, you know, just want to try something without necessarily writing a script. Yes, exactly. For example, if if we just to change this face, then we can say copy. Eh, we can drag and drop the path. <laughs> And we can say dot par dot period peri period dot val equal to zero point three. Uh, maybe just one more comment for uh, learning resources. There's also the operator snippet. Uh, ah, so yes. Which is really helpful for copy and pasting stuff. Um, you can even find some stuff where maybe you don't understand what exactly it's doing. But but you mean like uh, Python related operator snippets? Yeah, sure. Like if you, I mean, if you look at the script operators, for example, I don't think he shows those today. Um, but yeah, basically for any operator, I mean, it's, I guess it's a general touch thing. Um, ah yes, yes, yes. Here in operator if snippets. You look at operator snippets. There will be some some examples. <laughs> also, the Matthew Reagan is like a super extensive. I have the feeling that we can continue this discussion yes. forever, so maybe <laughs> <laughs> um, by taking a beer outside and uh, bring so in some fresh air, not boring the audience on the stream um, mm -hmm. with this. Uh, but definitely, thank you again. And, uh,
Hello, welcome back uh, with the next uh, presentation. But before we start with that, I have to say that we're very much depending on people from the community who uh, step forward and say that they want to do a presentation here. We're now in the lucky situation that the next month is already filled, the months after that. But um, there's going to be future months. We do this every month. And I can only encourage everyone to just um, come, also show work in progress. Doesn't have to be a streamlined presentation or anything. Could be tutorial style, like Philippe did today. Could be talking about projects. Could be talking about art, specifically. So we're really open for anything that's interesting to the community and related to visual programming. And uh, if you feel like that's something you would like to do, uh, just write me an email. Uh, you can do it at info at the note institute org or something a mixed scene. Um, and I'll be very happy to find a spot. Um, but now um, we have the pleasure to get uh, the Deus Ex Machina <laughs> <laughs> Wieland from behind the tech desk. And he's going to talk um, about callbacks and event systems and system building. So today is a tech day. Um, but Wieland is a very good uh, touch designer programmer. He builds very complex systems. So I'm very interested to see what he has to say uh, while I mess up the tech in the background. <laughs> Hi. No, because um, I want the people to see my face even on stream. Hi. OK, um, today is going to be extremely Python heavy, as it seems like, because that's also what I'm going to do, talk quite a lot about Python. And I'm going to talk about, uh, yeah, as Stefan already said, callbacks, which are a very important part of building reusable components and r basically like uh, building blocks of larger, more complex systems that uh, might get um, hard to read and hard to work with the larger they get. So maybe some words about me. Um, I'm in, in the interwebs, I'm uh, Alpha Moon Base Berlin. So um, I'm on the Discord, uh, also posting sometimes on the Facebook group. And I'm also the developer of the OLIP and quite a lot of the components from the OLIP. Um, just uh, a little note, if you scroll to the bottom of the OLIP web page and press this little button, uh, we actually have a dark mode. <laughs> um, and also another note is uh, what I do from time to time is I like to write down, not just present in person, what I know, especially about Python. So I have a YouTube channel with some tutorials. There, Sometimes I'm just rambling there or sh streaming working. Um, but also I write the Python tips and tricks uh, articles, or like I tend to write them on the derivative page so and this one i'm so you you need to have like at least a little grasp about python to understand them but i try to really break them down down into uh, small elements so it's uh, just like small pieces of knowledge that you can start um using um in your python um adventures <coughs> so basically here i'm talking about list comprehensions and for example something called sets which are super nice to use um, or talking about for loops for dictionaries for example um, and updating and uh, if we go uh, into part two um, yeah I'm talking about uh, properties for example um, and nesting op reference talking about a little bit of dry so it's like small information that uh, can be quite important to make your uh, Python programming more efficient and uh, less of a hassle to write because Python can be very nice to write if uh, you know some tricks. And one of the tricks, for example, is using um, callbacks. So what is a callback? Basically, um, you all, all have in one way or another already um, worked with callbacks, or I, I suppose. 
Um, for example, if we take a uh, OC in um, that, then here you have the callbacks. And basically, these are functions, um, or this is a Python module that reacts to specific conditions and events that appear on the specific operator. So for the OSC in, for example, we have the on receive OSC callback. So every time we receive an OSC message, of course, for one, we get the um, OSC uh, displayed here, but also we get this Python function that gets triggered every time. And we get past some very important information that we can then use uh, to trigger and handle our system. Or for example, um, if the message is a little bit more complicated, we can parse the message uh, directly in Python. So instead of then having some large chain of uh, operators that get hard to understand, we can instead just um, manage uh, them in some Python script that for some people like me, it's easier to understand and easier to grasp. Um, another, like the chop execute, for example, also is some kind of callback. Um, but why are they important? With uh, callbacks, when you do them your own, and if you start developing your own components, your reusable components, you can um, make very clear which functionality is accessible from the outside and what should we react to. For example, if I take from, that's the wrong one. If we take, um, let's take the <coughs> QR code reader, for example. It takes a moment because it's installing pip. Dup, 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 dup. Okay, that works now. <laughs> And now it's installing the actual package. Um, we have here the callbacks function. So what we can do is when we open this, okay, we have the QR code found callback that we can now just use to um, work with our project. And this makes it a lot easier because I don't have to now, again, like create this chain of events that I need to react to, to some changes in a that, but instead I have this event that I can react directly to. So uh, for example, let's imagine the following situation that uh, we have a movie file in and we are loading a large image. And I think we all were in the situation where we want to load a movie and it just like stalls the whole process. Um, and the, the trick, of course, is to say, okay, we reduce the file open timeout to zero. So it would like incrementally load, um, load the file. And when it's done, then it will uh, start displaying it. But the problem is, <laughs> while it's doing that, um, we have an issue. It's displaying black. So it would be nice to have a way to react to the situation that uh, the file finished opening. So uh, what we can do here is we can say, okay, we, we take an info and we drag our operator in. If we take a look here, we have see, okay, here's the uh, open uh, channel. So, and if we now tell this one to reload, it's somewhat hard to see for this one so maybe let's take the um, let's take the count okay it's also quite fast but you can see that the uh, open goes to zero and when it finished loading then it goes to one so what we can of course do right now is we can use a chop execute so good that we talked about that already so I don't have to talk too much about that uh, we drop it in and we select our, bop, 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 bop. let's take the open channel here. And we say on off to on. And let's just take a select here. And now we can simply say on off to on, say op select one dot par dot top equals op movie file in one. So let's try that again. 
and it's not working. I'm off to unopen. Oh. Uh, bo -bo -bo. So it's setting it. Let's just do it this way. So still not doing it. So let's do something else. Let's just remove this. And now open definitely is at zero. So let's put this one in again. And now we see, okay, work fine. <clears throat> but now we want to do it with a second one because we want to switch between the two. And now it starts to get annoying because now I have to copy it. I have to go into this whole script here. I have to say, oh, open movie file in two. And now I can select the movie here. And I mean, okay, now it's, uh, and as you can see, it just didn't work, which is insane. So let's do that again. And let's do that. Movie file in two. Now that's interesting. see it gets really annoying quite quite quick <laughs> so let's try something uh, else instead let's um, collapse all of this into its own component and now let's say we call this one movie player and we can customize it a little bit and uh, we can now just drop this one in here. So now we can here change our our file. Now we're not seeing it right now, but let's uh, move this one to the out so that we can see what actually is happening. And again, we can remove this. Works quite nice. Oops. And uh, our open here, of course, again, is at zero. <coughs> But still, now we have to go inside every time that we want to uh, adjust uh, or when we want to change the target, for example, for the select one here. And this is where the callbacks now come in. Because what we can do now is, um, I again go to the OLIP and I take the callback manager component here. So we take it and we simply place it here and we have to define the owner and now what we can do is uh, we press the init button so for now nothing has happened now if you press init we now have in our custom parameters we have the callbacks tab and we can say press call uh, create callbacks and it's like okay it's still like the default stuff not very interesting so let's write our own callback here. And this is uh, on load finish. And we give it the movie file in top. And we return. It's still not going to happen anything because we have to program it ourselves. But what we can now do is we can say, okay, again, we are reacting to the uh, channel open going from off to on. And what we are now doing is we're going to say op callback manager. And now we just call the do callback function. And what we uh, put in here is a string with the name of the function. So in this case, we say on load finish. And then we give it uh, an argument. And in this case, we say movie file in. OP movie file in. Okay, um, now let's say create callbacks. Okay, we have our on load finish. And yeah, I mean, let's do the same thing again. Let's say, okay, OP select one dot part of top equals movie file in top. All right, let's try this again. Mm -hmm. 
load our account here and it didn't work. I just have the feeling that the chop execute actually is not executing at all. <laughs> it's Maybe this thing where the zero and one is not actually zero and one is like it's yeah. Really fast. Maybe. So, but this works. Like it's uh, kind of confusing, and we have some error here. So let's try it again. If we get some information out of this, nope. Okay, but hmm. but really, what is interesting is I have a component that does exactly that, and it works flawlessly. So I'm a little bit confused right now. So let's uh, do some debugging and let's get the channel name here to see if anything executes at all. Cook this frame. Move it. All right. Yeah, but it's like. Okay, but now it's working for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> if you if you remove the debug now. Yeah. Will it not work again? Probably. Probably not. Now it works. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's uh, because I collapsed all of this and the module wasn't correctly um, or the, the operator didn't cook the first time. So sometimes it can be a good idea to just say force cook here. So, but now that we have this solved. Okay, so what does this mean? I can easily asynchronously load movies and have it uh, directly um, work in the select here. And the best part is now I can just copy this one No, that's interesting. <laughs> not switching around, I suppose, because I'm not just listening to the open here anymore. And now it's not going to work again. No, it does. Okay, let's copy this, and now we can just um, put in here another. It's not working. So I suppose when I now say force cook here. I tried it again. No dice. That's super interesting and annoying, like crazy, because this kind of makes what I'm, the point I want to get around uh, a little bit. <sighs> now that's extremely interesting. Let's see if this might help. Maybe put a null and make it always cook after the. Yeah, I suppose that's the. Uh, uh, yeah, but we can't use the uh, chop ex uh, parameter execute here in this case because we had we have to listen to the um, okay to to the movie being finally loaded. So let's try it again. Now it should also work without the debug. Uh, let's take the field guide. Okay, so now it's working and now I copy this one and hopefully, nope. It's very interesting. Oh. Let's try the following because what we can simply do is can also drop this one here. So now we have two movie players that are both listening to the same operator, uh, to the same, are uh, using the same callbacks. So now let's take this one, okay, this works. And let's do the same here. Okay, that's the same image, so. <laughs> tried it again but it's not working okay this is very confusing for me right now I'm sorry that it's this way <laughs> now it's super annoying um, because as I said there's like this um, this component here 
that is doing exactly that. So here we have the on load finish, we have the on play start, we have the on movie uh, finish, um, like a lot of information mm -hmm. that we normally would have to manage with a quite complicated network like this. And instead now it's this one component and uh, we can say on load finish. And if we look inside, we have a video out. We can say uh, op select one dot par dot top equals player player dot op video out. And if this also now doesn't work, I have to talk a word with uh, derivative. Okay, so that worked. No, it's not a Mac. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, it's super confusing. Sorry for that. Should have prepared that. But as I said, like here's the video player component. You can look into it to get a better feeling about this. Um, um, now I have another thing and I hope this one at least works. Because what we can also do with um, with callbacks or with the callback managers, we can compose um, callbacks and we can compose events because we are working with strings. Um, so what we can do right now, let me just check the clock. Okay, uh, let's take a clock. And let's get rid of the milliseconds here. We don't really need that. And we take a chop execute. And we are now looking for the value change. Way easier, easier to work with. And what we can now do is, um, because the channel object actually is not the value, or like channel, what we're given here, is not the, um, it's not the value, but it ins it's instead the channel object. And the channel object has some different values to it and some properties. For example, the name. So we have a sec min hour. And now, for example, if we just say uh, debug channel.name and we look into it, see, okay, sun phase is changing all the time. Quite interesting. But also, we see the second uh, moon phase. So let's get rid of uh, sun phase because it's like. Not really so interesting. And what we can now do with the callback manager, so let's place this again. Let's get the callback manager in here. Let's do this. Oop. And init it. And what we can now do is we can simply say uh, op callback manager do callback and now we can use an f string and the f string will be on and now we say uh, channel dot name dot and we want to have it in capitalize yeah I'm missing I'm missing this here okay so what does this do now exactly? Um, for example, we can now say define on sec. We can say define on min <coughs> and so on. So basically we can take every single one of these channels that are triggering. And now when we create the callback here, we have the on sec and we can just say debug second past. Now if we look into it. So and this can be quite powerful that you don't have to write out every single call of it because what some people might do as a first uh, impression would be to say, OK, um, if channel dot name equals sec op callback manager do callback on sec so that's also something that we could do but it would 
it just like gets very tedious to do all of this at the same time again and again and again. And this way it was like this composing of functions that you are presenting to the outside makes your life just way easier. Um, yeah, so I have to be honest, like the whole chop execute not executing kind of threw me off here. So also time wise, um, and this is why I'm just going to jump into a project that I'm working on right now that makes quite heavy use of uh, this technique and another technique, um, the event emitter and listener system. Um, maybe two words about this because it came up last time I presented the OLIP. Um, these are two components. We take an event, it's the event listener and the event emitter. And basically what this means is we have one emitter and we have an arbitrary amount of listeners that are listening to events emitted by this emitter. If this makes any sense. Um, you can imagine it like a radio station. So we have this one radio station and we have our radio devices and all of them can receive the same message and then they can interact depending on it. Like for example, if we have a uh, um, commercial going about some um, super good prices, then we have some people who will react in a way where they're like, okay, I will go now and I will buy something. And we have another um, listener who will just ignore it completely. And they don't even know anything of one another. And kind of similar like social media where it's like, okay, one person is sending something, a lot of people can receive it and they can react all to their own goods without having any, any knowledge of the other listeners um, in the system, which makes it quite um, powerful. I think it should be this one. And actually it's like quite a simple system uh, that I'm working on here right now. It's like a media player system um, that plays back uh, images, videos, um, notch files, tox files, and is then completely managed by a uh, CMS system. Um, and if we look into it, like this is the whole project structure. And here in the middle, you can see here we have the emitter. And as you can see, like everyone is in one way or another listening to this emitter component. And we have different steps. So we have uh, a webhook, for example. So I can trigger events by calling a specific function uh, with a web browser or with another touch designer process. Um, and we have our initializer. And the initializer will just uh, go over different steps. So we'll go over startup, enabling, syncing, environment, startup. And for every step, it will send an event. And it doesn't really care at all about what the receivers of this message are doing with it. Like there could be 500 receivers and the initializer wouldn't be the wiser because it's just like it's dumping the information and that's it. So in this init, like the init component and the init module of this project is completely separated into itself in a way where it's like not doing anything at all um, or it's doing something but it's uh, it can be tested it can be developed by a single person uh, without having to rely on on anything that's outside of its own domain yeah, I think domain is a good word for that um, so, for example, now if we go into the whole repositories uh, part, this is where I uh, store quite a lot of, um, where I store information that I gather from different sources from uh, web servers. And the really interesting part is, um, okay, here we have the on sync request. And this is the listener. And this listener is listening to our emitter. And here, in this case, we are um, basically just listening to the on-sync request to gather the information when uh, this event gets fired. And this event can be fired from a lot of different places. And this is, again, the good thing. The listener doesn't care who sends this event. It just cares that we have the event. So we have this very specific point 
which is everyone's listening to and everyone can send to, but no one knows basically of the other um, inhabitants of the project. So we can bring them in very small um, elements that we can work with and that we can reuse again. Um, <clears throat> same basically goes with the schedule. So the schedule says, okay, the, the moment uh, the synchronization with CMS is done, um, then we definitely should check the schedule. And then we do this. So, and I can just also do this by hand for testing purposes, because it's like, again, it's like its own different module in the project environment without having to rely on, on all of the other stuff. And what I'm doing here is I'm doing some checking and in the end I'm saying, hey, okay, um, if there is a change in the schedule, I will just send an event out again to the event emitter and say there was a change in the playlist. And that could mean a lot of things for different elements. It could be that we write a log message. It can be that we send an update to uh, a logging server or a web server. It can be that we are telling our playlist component to change actually the playlist. Um, but it could, could also mean, okay, we, we have to do some other checks or uh, we're going to relay a message to other computers in the same network that might need this information too because they also want to know where the message comes from. But the schedule itself doesn't care. And this is the important part about this modularization. <laughs> I can't speak. I can't English today. <clears throat> um, and then again, here we have the playlist and the playlist then just says, okay, yeah, we, we have our selected playlist and it's doing some checking. And the playlist is um, having listening to the request next. So there is an entity, obviously, that is requesting the next entry in the playlist. And it can be anything. Again, it can be manually triggering this element to load the next uh, entry in the playlist. So, yeah. It doesn't know about anything. It knows about itself and it knows about the repository, of course, because everyone has to know about the repository, about the data. But yeah, as you can basically see, I can trigger it again from inside without having to rely on, <clears throat> on any outside forces or states. And this one again is just going to emit the load next event. And now we can have a, um, a video player, for example. And that's what's happening here. <clears throat> um, so the video player, again, is listening to the onload next event. And it's saying the player, hey, okay, load this next um, entry in the playlist and preload it. And again, like this is where the whole callbacks come in. Because basically what I have here is I have different prefabs for media loaders. I have a movie loader, I have an image loader, I have a component loader, and I have a package loader. And the package basically is, again, like a Tox project uh, with like a lot of sub-dependencies. And the cool part is they all use the same callbacks. So basically what I have to do is I have to define my callbacks only once. And all of these players are triggering the same callbacks. And what, I, what can I do? I can say, okay, um, on trigger, I can tell my parent, play the next video, or basically I could say, okay, on load finish, display the next one. And then again, after a while, we will get a message from the playlist stating, hey, you have to play the next content. And the player will say, okay, I'm going to play the next content. And so this way it's like, they are all communicating without knowing exactly who's communicating with whom, but they know the, the, the content of the message and what they, what they, the elements themselves, should do with it. And the uh, players basically spout out their message using the callback so I don't have to go inside of them. Because for me, they all react the same in a way that they give me the same messages and they give me the same information and it's extremely clearly readable what is happening. I don't have to use a chop execute listening to some open 
parameter channel that maybe means something or maybe set by hand or whatever. No, instead I have this, okay, on load finish, parent load done. That's the information and I can, I can work quite nicely with this. And in the end, what we can do is we can do some wiretapping. Basically, I already told this, but here in the logging, I can just also with the event listen, I can just listen to every event that got called. And so, yeah, I can just log every event and can just write this in a very nicely understandable and readable, and I can see who emitted which event. So I can understand what is, what's the order of, uh, of elements, what's the order of actions, and why might something happen in a way where it doesn't happen, uh, or I don't want it to happen this way. Okay. How do you do the logging side? Um, that's my logging module. So you can find it in the, here's the logger. And there, basically, I'm just calling the dot .log function, and I can pass it an arbitrary amount of, uh, of messages and information. And here, we can also say, OK, do I want to have a file output? Do I want to have a text port output? Because quite often, you don't really want to have the text port output, because it can be a little bit verbose from time to time, but um, especially during debugging, you can just say text port on, text port off, and you can even timestamp the file. So every day it, it changes, gets to a new day, it will create a new log file for you. Um, and then you have to trace offset. And this is quite a powerful um, parameter, um, which basically says, um, Okay, because we have a lot of functions that we need to go through to come to the logger, um, but I can traverse this trace. I can uh, go the chain up and understand which function called this event. Um, which, like, what was the reason that led to the log happening? And with the trace offset, you can basically increase the steps you want to go back. Um, so what, yeah, that's basically what I can see here. I can see, okay, um, obviously in module, in this module here, in project logging text one on line one, there was a message text. Oh, as you can see, that's this one. And this way I can understand, okay, who's responsible for which message. Um, is it just like a visually, like how far up you go? Or? What do you mean by dynamically? Like I'm taking the trace stack uh, every lock and traverse it up, but. Um, right, and this controls like uh, how far up you Yes, go, exactly. Right? So I could set this to, to zero or to one, but then I would start to get like the internal functions of my extensions. Um, okay. But I could. But so that means that uh, when it's Yes, exactly. Like, no, we can't go like all of the trace stack and storing it because I think then it would start to get, but it's actually quite an interesting idea to maybe implement this in one way or another, but I have the feeling it would get also performance wise uh, quite heavy. Yeah. Yeah. But this way having like the, uh, having like the caller and the debugged element um, I think these are like the two most important parts and with the trace offset, we can just move this around specifically. More questions? Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I've been working on almost exactly this uh, uh, recently and uh, what I end up using is um, this new feature um, dependency callbacks yeah, I'm no fan of that at all. <laughs> I just started like yeah. last week playing with this <clears throat> and trying to understand like what's your idea. Yeah, it's, I basically already had with Marcus this discussion about the um, TDU dependency and the callbacks. And the main problem with this is um, you're starting to create closures. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so closures basically is, okay, you are reinitializing your uh, extension, for example, and you're creating a new TDU dependency object, but yeah, the old one is not going to be yeah, cleared yeah. out because you're starting to have some references to it somewhere in your code. And because you can't visually see it, mm -hmm. um, it starts to get extremely confusing, extremely fast. And I, I burned my fingers more than once using closures uh, or like having this purely Pythonic uh, references um, with operators. So internally, for example, to the event emitter and listener system, I'm just storing the reference to the operator mm -hmm. because the operator will always be the same yeah. and not changing. And like even under reinitialization, you, you don't have uh, this like stray references and stray dependency object that suddenly are no longer attached to any operator, but still exist and yeah, yeah. might start to, to create some weird uh, behavior. So absolutely not a fan of that. Mm -hmm. Operator references all the way, go for it, because operators are quite tough in a way that um, even if they are destroyed, you still can use, for example, the is valid member um, so because just because an operator is destroyed doesn't mean it's gone forever, but it still remains a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so you can check out if it still exists, for example, or not, without having to do some weird null checking or something. So. Yeah. More questions? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah, quite tech heavy today. Um, really sorry about this shop execute thing not working. I have to, to look into this because it felt like or felt like a bug to me. Um, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, basically, you can just like look around in the OLIP and look for my components, and uh, a lot of them implement the whole callback scheme. So, yeah, great. Clipping that. So, I still have to do work on that. <laughs> Uh, another little break and then at 10 we're gonna switch to Toronto and to Marcus for some
Hey everybody, uh, thank you for staying. You know, it's not too easy <laughs> with these temperatures. But now we come to um, another highlight of this evening, and it's uh, our connection to Toronto. Marcus Heckman from the Derivatives Headquarter, and he's going to talk a bit about the VR workflow and news about that. So, uh, hello to Marcus. Hello. Hello. You can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Uh, perfect. Very nice to see everybody. And thanks again, Stefan Wieland, for organizing this. So it's nice to be um, from remotely in Berlin, at least. Um, so yeah, I thought uh, we added a little tiny tool into Touch Designer recently, which is the audio binaural shop. And I thought that might be a good idea to um, talk a little bit about the VR workflow in Touch Designer because uh, working myself on a VR project and uh, having attempted to do something in, un in Unreal, I found that the process in Touch Designer is so simple and really rewarding in compared in comparison that um, it needs to get more out there. Uh, the basics, what I have here is I have one of those Oculus Quest headsets and a uh, controller. There's a second controller, but not enough hands um, to control everything. And um, yeah, I might just take you through A, what the binaural shop does, and B, how to set up one of those whole environments. And um, I'll share my screen. Let's start with that. So the uh, I mean, the idea for uh, VR or 360 video is uh, fairly simple. You create an environment, you render it out perhaps as a 360 video, and this is the first thing that I'm going to look at with you. And then um, usually you need some kind of 360 sound. And some of you that worked with maybe in VR might know of the audio render shop, which can create um, or which takes a which takes a, a wave. Uh, sound and maps it in relation to a listener and uh, what is it actually called? A listener and a source object. And this can output binaural, which is uh, stereo basically, or stereo headset, but um, attenuated for the distance of the object and kind of where the sound is coming from. And it can also output ambisonics. And the ambisonics is an idea where, um, well, let's just put an audio file in here. So the ambisonics is an idea where the sound gets essentially mapped on a 360 sphere around you. That might be the easiest explanation for it. So given a source where the sound is coming from and a listener object where the sound is listened to, uh, it creates by default, it's a third order ambisonic. So you get these 16 channels, which basically represent positions in space. And this can then be used if you are having, for example, uh, if you're rendering it out as a 360 video and then playing it back in YouTube, then the YouTube player converts this ambisonic depending on your head position um, to uh, actually, I don't know if does YouTube do VR? I have no clue. OK, anyway, some to research. Um, converts this again into a binaural signal. So you have this idea that there's 360 sound around you. Um, and a little bit like how would we create actually a 360 movie? Let's start off with a scene that we might want to render in 360. And for that, I'll take the uh, particles GPU, just because that's easy. And the particles GPU now has two top outputs. There's more outputs that you can, or more internal tops that you can get access to. But the first one is basically a preset render, like the rendered output from this. And the second one is just the point position. So I'm going to use that. And with instancing, adding a point, uh, converting that into a particle, uh, da -da -da -da, convert into particle per point and then creating a geometry and then using instancing on this geometry to render these points in space. 
So my active is the alpha and then X, Y, Z are the RGB channels. And I have my, not sure how well you can see that over the Zoom connection here, but basically I get my uh, render again. And I'm gonna attach a line mat to that because the line mat now works so nicely, uh, but not as lines, but points. And now I wanna render this as a 360 movie. For this, I need a camera. And because we're in the center of a virtual sphere, I need to change the translate parameter here a little bit to put the camera into the center. Put down a render top. Da, 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 da. There. I'm just going to choose a resolution of 1024 by 1024 because um, I will be outputting not the uh, uh, standard 2D render mode, but a cube map. So cube map is basically the view in all directions around you. And then with a project uh, projection top, convert this whole thing into a accurate rectangular. And now you're gonna change the resolution here of that uh, custom resolution, let's say 2480 by, oops, that's a little bit much. 2480 by 1024 and the output aspect to the resolution. So this is basically my 360 degree um, view around me. You realize you're going 360 degrees around and 180 degrees uh, top bottom. This is because you're mapping it onto a sphere. So um, that's the first step. Movie fell out. And now you perhaps want to attach some audio and it would be nice to have like kind of a 3D sound to the whole thing. Uh, and for this, we can make use of this audio render chop. I'm just going to split this left right here uh, da, 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 so we can see what I'm actually doing. And for that, I'll create first, I'll take an LFO just to animate my sound position a little bit. Uh, channel T X, Y, Z and offset, this is the only script thing I'll do, sorry, face is me dot input, no, no, me dot chen index times one divided by three. So I get like three nicely animated channels, uh, face offset equally. And then I got to create an object which will be my sound source. So this is just a null component and export uh, TX, TY, and TZ to it. So let's make this a little bit slower here, like that. And I hope you can see the screen, like the now going around here. And now I can do what I just did. I would be taking an audio file in and uh, audio render. The audio render again needs the listener object, which would be my camera, because that's where my head would be in a 360 video. And the source object, which would be my, uh, my yeah, the sound source. And then it converts it automatically to binaural. So now already you can basically stand in there and just listen to it. Uh, later on, we can see if we would animate the camera or if we would set tie the camera to the headset, we could also get the correct binaural audio for the head position. But what I actually want to do is I don't want to have binaural here, but I want to have this eventually in um, like the Oculus TV player or something like this. So I need the ambisonics here. And this is creating my 16 channels that I need. And I can use those as my um, audio chop in my audio file out. One thing, uh, probably best to set this to uncompressed 16 bits so that you can have all 16 channels in there. And with that, we are basically ready to render the movie and output the movie. Now, um, Oftentimes, what you would do, though, is you might have a production where you don't just have a simple audio waveform and you're 
uh, printing it onto this 360 sphere with the audio render, but maybe you get a really highly produced already ambisonic track. So meeting the person who ever uh, sat in the studio used all kinds of different software to produce this amb amb ambisonic track for you. And this is, I have here one of those, this then basically already comes in as a 16 channel audio waveform. And now for uh, to play this back in touch designer or uh, use that, this is where the audio binaural would come into play, where you can take the input format and the sonics and again have a listener object, which would be my camera, and convert this into a binaural output or a stereo output essentially, so that depending on your head position, you're getting the right audio from it. Um, so this makes really completes kind of this uh, workflow to have a produced 360 videos or use uh, externally produced ambisonic tracks and uh, use them inside your VR production. Um, the uh, audio binaural shop does all kinds of conversions. So your input format uh, could also be a, a quadraphonic surround or 5.1, 7.1 or custom setups, which uh, we also have in the audio render um, chop the, these mapping tables where you basically can um, tie positions in via the mapping table itself. But um, let's continue with this a little bit because this is just a 360 video and this is great, but uh, honestly, it always looks, depending on the content that you're creating, uh, these 360 videos are uh, have tons of compression artifacts and whatever. So you probably want to look at this particle system in the glasses in a tethered way. And this is quite simple in touch designer as well. Also the interaction. And that's the next step I'm going to go over with you. Or I'm going to cover with you now. So I still have my uh, particle geometry here that I want to look at. And uh, we have a few operators that give you access to the headset or to the position of the headset and um, other operators that let you output to the headset. So let's start with what we actually need to render into the headset. We need two cameras because essentially inside this thing, we have um, two screens and you need a render for each screen so that you can have a proper stereo output. Um, so I'm gonna put down an Oculus Rift shop and let's see if this is connected. Yeah, it's connected. And you can see when I move my uh, headset here, I'm getting all of these channels. And one is a general position of the headset. And the other thing is the left eye and the right eye transformation matrix. So basically the transformation matrices for our uh, cameras that we need to create. So let's select that out separately. Select, uh, we need I left in one shop. So we get all of these uh, matrix components here. Add an all to it just because that's cleaner. Um, I left uh, us and we'll do the same for the right eye. I right, whoop, I right pus and hook up two cameras to it. Cam left. And now, again, you have to pay attention. The uh, default translate in the camera has a Z offset of five, but we want to always have this uh, zeroed out. So we're looking, we're only taking the transform from actually what we're getting from the uh, VR device here. Now, to use these matrix values, you want to go to the pre-transform page and enable the apply pre-transform, and then use the chop as the um, input to the transform matrix chop that parameter. Now you can see uh, if I move my headset, you can see that camera moving with it. Okay, going to create a right camera here as well and use the I right position for this one and 
a little bit hard to see, but basically you see those two cameras now here overlaid and um, animating when I move the headset. So this whole thing now we need to render. We need two renders for this. First question would be, what's the resolution? What do we need to render this with? And we can get this information also from the Oculus Rift shop here. And this is by turning on the device info channel or parameter on the Oculus Rift shop. And what pops in is this render left width height and render right width height. Now they are always, or they should always be the same. It would be strange if they would be different. So we'll just grab, although it might be interesting actually. Um, one thing with these uh, VR setups, what I find interesting here is that because we have access to each eye separately, you can create all kinds of strange effects for, um, for the viewer but more of that later. So we have our render left width and height, and I'll use this as the resolution for my render top here. Export, export. And now we need to specify the cameras and we can specify both cameras right away. And left, and right. And because I now have two cameras here, I can just create another top, which is a render select, reference the main render top and change the color buffer index to zero because we only have one color buffer, but we have a second camera. So I can select the second camera for my um, right eye render. Just to show you what's happening there, if we put a difference here, can kind of see how they're uh, slightly offset from each other. Um, yeah, and this now has to be passed to the Oculus somehow. And we can do this with the um, Oculus top. Where is it? Oculus Rift top takes two inputs, a left eye and a right eye. And um, it's complaining because your root FPS should be 90. So let's do that as well, even though I won't hit 90 now, but um, that doesn't matter. At least the warnings go away. This is warning about texture coordinates. Let's just ignore this right now. And uh, I do now have the render going out to the Oculus here. Uh, hard to show you because, well, that's the problem with VR. It's a very solitary experience, so to speak. But anyway, um, one thing I forgot is while we have the position of the cameras, what we also need is actually the uh, um, the uh, uh, projection matrix for those two uh, cameras, and those we can get as well. We can get them as well with the Oculus uh, Rift shop because not only is the head mounted display being output, but also the left projection matrix. So we can get that. And in on the view page of your camera, you change this to a custom projection matrix and then use that chop here. And you can copy paste this, select the right projection matrix and on the camera for the right eye, do the same thing, custom projection matrix, and pass that in. So now we should have, I'm just going to confirm this quickly. I can totally pretend that everything is working. Everything is working. Great. Perfect. Um, so we now have already output to our uh, Oculus. And the remaining part would be literally to use audio render chops or use an audio file in if we have a pre-created, um, if we have a pre-created uh, ambisonic file and um, the audio binaural chop, we now would have to um, include a listener object here. And the listener object can come as well from the Oculus Rift head mounted display chop here by just selecting the uh, positional data. So this would be those TXYZ and RXYZ. 
Oh, Brenda comes with it. Whoops. There. Export that onto a listener object, which just will be a null component, like so. That. And Rx. Y R Z reference this here. And now we have, oh yeah, that's a funny one. I have to look at that. It's complaining about the 90 frames per second uh, not being too well working with the uh, sample rate of the audio file, but anyway. Um, and then pass that into an audio device out, which can then be the, uh, um, speakers from the Oculus. So here, headphones, Oculus virtual audio device. So that's now outputting to that. And depending on depending on where my uh, headphones up or my headset is pointing in, it's going to change the audio waveform so that you have this uh, 360 sound experience from it. It's going to turn it off again. All right. Now um, the last part, maybe that I wanted to show is that you often have interactive parts inside a 3D scene, inside a 3D, um, uh, inside a VR experience. And uh, we usually use this controller to interact with any objects that might be in the scene. So for example, we might wanna click on a little cube and I'm gonna just create a box here and um, put this into a geometry, make that a little bit smaller and move it out uh, in front of the camera a little bit. And this might be like a box when I click on it, I don't know, some particle attributes will change or maybe just the color will change. Now, how can we get from the controller to the box, how can we do that? And this is also, it's uh, kind of built in. It works, works really nicely. It's a little bit of a funny, you have to think of it in a way, but um, easy to set up. So again, an Oculus Rift shop, which gives me my left controller and right controller. I have the right controller here. So I'm gonna use that, uh, let's see if it comes in. Yep, there it is. And now how can we pick in our render or in a render, how can we pick this box object? Um, and the idea here would be that you think of the controller itself as a camera and the camera sends out a ray and wherever the ray hits, uh, that's where it's gonna try to pick the, um, the an object. So, um, we need a camera because we're going to use the render pick shop for it. Can you also use the render pick that? That would be much more appropriate if you have multiple controllers, but just let's, let's just go with the render pick uh, shop for this example. And I'm going to call this cam controller. And we need to give this camera basically the orientation and uh, position of this uh, controller coming from the Oculus Rift shop. So again, a little bit of exporting here. TX, TY, TZ, RX, RY, RZ. Okay. So, and now this camera here, um, let's see, is basically my controller. And it's always looking to where my controller is looking at. And we can simulate this or we can make this a little bit nicer because uh, we don't want to see a camera for the controller, but perhaps we want to see actually the controller. So there's an Oculus Rift sub and the Oculus Rift sub can display the right controller and left controller for you. Now the controllers look a little bit different in the in the API 
what comes with it than in reality. That's uh, they updated the look a little bit, but that's close enough. And with that, I'm going to create a geometry here. Um, just because you want to parent that to the camera, to your camera, which is the controller. And now we should be seeing this controller actually in here. See, there it is. And we also can attach a beam to it. Got to clean up my mess here a little bit. So that we know when we're looking in the, uh, in the glasses that we see where we're actually pointing to. And this is going to be not a special beam. It's just going to be a line sub, uh, which extends ten units. Create a geometry, parent the geometry also to the controller geo, and we'll add a line mat to draw to uh, see that actually in our scene. And now I should see, yeah. So now I have my controller here. And now what I want is when the controller hits this box, the box should, for example, change in color. So let's add a material here to the box, first of all. It's just going to be a constant material for now. And yeah, as I said, because this is a camera and there's like a single beam coming from the center, and we need a render to render pick from for that camera. So again, I need a render top. The nice thing is this render top just uh, resolution wise, it just needs to be one by one pixel. It doesn't, you don't need to see more because you're just sending in this out this one ray. It really just needs to be that single center point. Um, the camera is our controller and the geometry would be our box here because we don't have any other geometry currently that we that we want to pick. And the next thing is we need a render pick, um, render pick chop. And we want to say we want to control these parameters because we only want to pick from the center. We only have this one pixel here anyway, so we just want to pick from the center. And when the camera moves nothing changes. It's always the center of the camera of the controller that we're picking from. So UD 0.5 is perfect. We just need to give it a render pass top, which we have here. And now we can try and see if I, oh yeah, there. When I hit the box with my beam, I get a trigger in my uh, render pick. Now the nice thing is you don't even have to you don't even have to render this uh, the render top you can turn the render flag off it works still it still works the same and now I'm just going to use the um, let's say we'll just use the uh, picked channel here and uh, change the color of the constant material of our box a slight trickery. Uh, there's a feedback loop currently. So because I'm rendering the box, I'm picking from it, and then I'm going back onto the box, onto a parameter of the material, there's a feedback loop that is created. So we have to add a feedback chop into here. Uh, that's something we should be looking at. But uh, currently, that's the workaround. And why is that not doing anything? Yeah, if I hit it, color changes. Perfect. So um, since the controllers give you more information, let's have a look what we get. We get all these button touches here. Button touches and button presses. We could now use those to uh, uh, script other or control other things in our uh, environment here. But essentially, this is um, what you need to create a full interactive experience. You can create menus with it to start a show or pause a show or um, script interactions that uh, 
enable sound or not. Um, but all of this is very, it's very contained. It's fairly uh, quick to build out and quick to experiment with, even with built-in components like the uh, particle GPU, for example. If this network seems a little bit unwieldy currently, because I build it all out live and it doesn't look very nice right now, um, there is some components that can help you uh, rediscover those things or re, um, revisit these ideas. Uh, there's particular, there is the Oculus Rift section in the palette, which has the Oculus Rift simple component in there. Uh, this is a real good, um, it's a real good eye hurting component. Um, it's the complete setup as I just built it out for you without the interaction. And yeah, it shows again that you have those, the left eye and the right eye as separate channels. This is really unique to touch designer in a way that um, if you want to uh, change the, the color of only one eye, you can certainly do that here um, and see what happens to your viewers. Uh, it's a interesting exercise and interesting to play around with. Similarly, there's also the uh, uh, TDVR section here, which, and now I hope I'm not breaking stuff when I do this because it starts the, uh, not the Oculus, but it starts the um, open v uh, the Steam VR environment. And this, th this component, when you drag in TDVR, is itself a whole set of other components that are also available in the system components and utilities and world object sections of the same palette con uh, folder. And it basically presents you with a complete um, interactive environment. So here you have separate controller components. You have a RayPick component, which is connected via the uh, render manager, which is connected to all the VR controllers that you have in here. So the RayPick component takes care of all of these controllers. It also takes care of the gaze. So you can uh, get triggers when you're looking at things as well. And this is all implemented here. Um, it has itself uh, callbacks as well that then can be triggered when you're looking at objects or when you're uh, triggering objects. And yeah, it's, uh, it's a fun environment to play around with. Um, incredibly easy to set up initially, even if you just want to go with a, um, not with a pre-made setup, but with a self-made setup. And um, yeah, really easy to have uh, quite fantastic results with it. Like beautiful particle simulations in the, uh, in the Oculus um, Quest, that is. Uh, nothing I've seen out there um, otherwise. It's really, um, touch designer is quite special uh, in that, how it works. Uh, yeah, any questions? Everybody's still uh, approach with the cube maps. There is this, there's a few problems with that, right? So you can't really use SSAO, and then the render looks bad, and then also some occasions you really see the edges of the cube. Um, is there a workaround why to come to this 360 degree view? I mean, you can open the camera, I think 280 degrees, maybe you could stitch together 280s, but are you aware of something that works better than the cube map approach? Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, am I still? Am I still? You can hear me. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, you could try rendering this as a dual paraboloid, I guess. Let's see if you have better results with that. You mean, um, I, uh, it's a little bit hard to understand, but when you have a cube map, you sometimes see the, the corners of the cube in the, in the 360 render then. We have corners where you kind of can see that it's with a cube map. Uh, uh, yeah, you could try if this has better results if you're like rendering a, um, a dual paraboloid and uh, then creating an equi rectangular out of that. I haven't tried that. So the projection top has a couple uh, different inputs that you could try out um, for that. But yeah, I should look into that. I have an unrelated question. It's like, why you were using everywhere chop exports and not chop references? Is it more performant? Uh, um, no, not at all. That's uh, muscle memory. <laughs> if, yeah, that's me. Uh, there's no, there's no, no real reason for it. Um, I think the uh, most of these have been. Uh, optimized and therefore you can use references everywhere. Yeah, I don't know why I like chops so, and uh, export so much. It's a good question. Oh. I play muscle memory. Uh, yeah. Well. Thanks for listening in. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> need a moderator. <laughs> it's in. Yeah, so that was uh, mainly the Touch Designer Roundtable. Thank you for coming. But um, if uh, you care for more beer <laughs> after this, um, you would go to the Omega Bar, which is just on the right side down the street. Uh, we have a table reserved there and they have excellent beers and alcohol free drinks. And because we are, I mean, you can still hang around here if you want, but we're going to slowly close it down so we can also have Feierabend. And um, yeah, it would be a pleasure to meet you there. Um, and again, um, I have to say it, uh, if you have something that you would like to present at the Touch Designer Roundtable, work in progress, whatever it is, doesn't have to be like a streamlined presentation. Could be something techy like today, could be something very, I mean, not tacky, but techy. Um, could be something arty, could be something philosoph philosophical, which we haven't had yet, but need it <laughs> then please uh, just drop me an email and um, I'll be happy to find the right spot and go through with it um, and thanks a lot to Wieland who uh, behind the big screen is pulling the strings <laughs> to make it seamless yeah that was it thank you very much thank you. sorry Thanks for the applause, but <laughs> I forgot to say the next time we're going to have uh, two exciting guests. It's going to be um, Florence Toe. She's like a, a visual artist working with touch designer, much in the music field, doing shows for artists, but also her own art stuff. And um, Adam Berg. I feel like I'm saying it wrong. But yeah, and he has been a uh, technical, di technical director with um, Le Leviathan in New York, who did like also big scale and exciting uh, projects. And he's also going to talk about his past there and his future in Berlin, because he recently moved here. So that's going to be uh, an exciting edition, and it's going to be end of July. And if I'm not wrong, it's going to be the 28th of July. If I'm wrong, it's always the last Thursday in the month. I hope to see you all there. Thank you.
You don't have to talk about it. Thank you.